Earthlings. So it's another month with Darker Music Talks. I'm Tommy Darker. Uh, probably, you know, you've recognized this beard. I see a lot of new people today. That's pretty cool. It's really nice. And, and this is a record. We've never had that many people with not enough chairs and not enough room for that. So I think this is great. Um, okay, so just so you know, I'm going to repeat again what Darker Music Talks is all about. So this is a stage for you to ask questions and talk with an expert on a specific subject, right? So this is what it's all about. It's about interaction. Most um, music industry conferences, they have, um, a, they have panels. They have people that know stuff, you know, and they tell you this is what you need to know. And then have a Q&A. So this one is the Q&A. So everything here is a Q&A. It's not about Nicholas showing what he knows. It's not about you being there and, and thinking and then like not knowing what to do. It's about asking. And any question, you can interrupt Nicholas. This is all about it. It's about the questions. So um, I have something really nice to announce. Um, soon, Darker Music Talks, this thing here, this informal conversation, formally organized, will start spreading in 13 more countries. So I will start traveling around. <laughs> Cheers. So, so that's really nice because it shows that musicians in the music world need things like that. They think they want interaction, they want to learn, they're hungry for something, for, for change, to be more entrepreneurially oriented, and finally create businesses around this beautiful, beautiful thing called music. So please just interrupt anytime, ask questions, I'll be around. The only rule that I have is if you have any question, just raise your hand and I'll bring the microphone so we can record it and have a nice sound for everybody around the world to, to hear your question on the video, right? If you want to be not paying attention to Nicholas and be tweeting, just use that, that thing, so everybody can see what you're writing, okay? You, you can write not, like bad stuff, it doesn't matter anyways. Uh, Ian, the last time, he was just cursing all the time, so we don't, we're not gonna restrict anyone. So that's it, um, we're gonna get started, and yep, let's hope everybody enjoys this. Thank you. Thank you, Tommy. Hello, everybody. Uh, my name is um, Nicholas Lovell. Um, I've written a book called The Curve. I'll give you a little bit of an introduction into me in a moment. Um, I'm not planning on using the microphone. If anybody has any trouble hearing me, put two hands up, then I'll know that it's just speak louder rather than you have a burning question. Um, I'm supposed to talk about this. Freeloaders, superfans, and the future of business. Only I changed it and put uh, that bit in there for, for this talk. Um, I care a lot about the future of business, and I care a lot about the future of culture. Um, a long time ago, I used to be an investment banker. I stopped doing that in 2003, so the global financial crisis wasn't my fault. Um, although I still wear cufflinks and um, continue to look a little bit like a banker. And part of that is because it's important to me that I straddle these two worlds, this world of finance and making money, and this world of creation and getting paid for making stuff. Because one of the things that I've seen as we go into this world of the internet is that it becomes really, really easy for people to share stuff, which is awesome. Although they share that stuff without us getting paid, which is less good. Um, and I wrote The Curve because I wanted to start addressing that issue. Um, where does my knowledge of this come from? Well, you'll see in the next 40 minutes or so. But for the last five years, my focus has been on the video game industry. And in particular, how do you make money from free? And video games are better at it than pretty well any other entertainment medium out there. So the curve came from all of my work, which I did with free games, most recently Angry Birds Go, which is their first fully free uh, launch game. Um, but then I built on it with books and music and uh, television and art and, as you'll see, flower and swimming pools and all sorts of other things which you don't think of as being digital products. Also, the other thing which has happened is that I used to care about this sort of intellectually, but now I'm an author with a book which people can pirate. I care quite a lot about this on a personal level. Um, it makes quite a difference to me now. Uh, so um, it's quite important to me that this works, uh, not just in a sort of um, academic funded. I make my living from this stuff, so I need to make sure it works. So that's sort of the preamble, pre pre uh, there, the preamble and the background. I am happy to be interrupted, although I will expect to stop in about 40 minutes and then it will be very much be an open uh, discussion. Um, if you have your own experiences to share through this, that would also be very, very helpful. Um, but first of all, I want to start talking about this. Um, how do we make money when everything is going free? And I'm going to start with the very low-tech alt-tab technology um, by showing you a video. Uh, 
the video which my three-year-old calls the dancing penguin video. She's not excited about the bit with me in it, but she's very, very excited about the dancing penguin. How do you make money when everything is going free? If you make music or games, books or television, you've been struggling with this for years. But what about those of you who make swimming pools, or flowers, or manufacture lemon squeezers and chocolate? Free is coming to you too, as digital printing and 3D manufacturing brings casual piracy to the world of physical products. Are you scared? Yes. Yeah. You should be excited too, because the thing that is destroying the value of everything you hold dear is also giving you an unprecedented chance to build your business or to finance the creation of your own. To understand that, you need to understand the curve. The curve is a new way of seeing the world that shows us not to be afraid of giving some things away from your customers and fans are getting things for free, legally or illegally, anyway. And this is your opportunity. Because the web allows you to build one-to-one -one relationships with those customers and fans. It allows newcomers to experience what you do for free, while allowing your biggest supporters to spend lots of money on things they truly value. And as customers and fans ourselves, the curve shows us how our relationship with the artists, creators and companies we love is about to change, allowing us to focus on the things that we really the curve comes in three parts. Use free to find an audience. Use technology to figure out what that audience values and to move them along the curve from freeloaders to superfans. And let your biggest fans spend lots of money, and I do mean lots, on things they really value. The curve solves the pressing problem of the digital age. How to make money when everything is tending towards free. I'm Nicholas Lovett. Join me to explore the curve. I'm trained to wait to the end of that because she gets very cross if I stop the middle of that bit. <laughs> so, um, uh, you don't need to read the book now. You don't need to hear from me. That's the, that's the answer. Um, that's obviously part of my free strategy. It's, on, it's a video which costs a meaningful amount of money and time to create. It's on YouTube. Annoyingly, it's on the Penguin channel, not on my channel, which means it's sandwiched between uh, uh, Claire Balding talking about becoming a lesbian and Delia Smith talking about something else, which is a bit pointless in terms of building a relationship with fans. But that's you know, publishers for you. That's what I had to do. Um, but nevertheless, it's embeddable, and I want people to share that to get my message across. And I hope that some people will take something from that. Others will take something from this talk. Some people will go onto the book, and other people will come to my website and become true super fans. But what I want to start talking about, I'm going to turn this around so I don't have to keep looking back at the screen, is that I do a lot of consulting work, mainly in the games industry, but also with other industries, books, television, and so on. And people say these sort of things. You can't make money from apps. We've got to make people start valuing content again, and I deserve to be paid for my work. And my answer is yes, you can, no, you can't, and no, you don't. They really don't like that last one, never. And my point is that you need to earn the right to be paid. You need to build a relationship with customers which says, I make stuff, and if you want me to keep making stuff, I need money. So I'm going to give you ways to give me money. I don't believe in pay what you want. That's not the strategy I'm pushing forward. I believe in you creating ways to create emotional resonance with your fans and your followers, and indeed your customers, that enables you to earn the right to say, yes, I do want to give you money. And let's talk a little bit about how, because you're going to want to ask that at some point. Does anybody recognize that? Put your hand up if you recognize that. Put your hand up if you've played it. There are some people in this room who are lying. Um, that's Candy Crush Saga. It's the most popular game in the world right now. Um, 255 million people played it in the last 30 days. 93 million people played it yesterday. Uh, so it is phenomenally, phenomenally successful. It's free. 70% of people who have finished Candy Crush Saga all 500 levels now. Let's see if the people in the room, has anybody finished Candy Crush Saga? Anybody? Oh, the, okay, put your hand up if you played Candy Crush Saga. Put your hand up if you played it. Come on, be honest. Really, just five of you. You're so lying. Who's beyond the level of 50? 100? 200? 207? I don't like you anymore. Okay, you win. You win. Um, you're, further, you're further than me. Um, it's free. Sorry? 347. You're very good. Um, have you spent any money? <laughs> have you spent any money? Sorry? Have you spent any money? You haven't. I have, and you're still way ahead of me. Um, that, the company behind it is called King. 
Uh, they are a company which only makes free games now. Uh, last year, its revenue was $1.9 billion, and 73% of that came from this game alone. So free clearly makes money. Does anybody recognize this game? There's one person who does. Uh, where is he? He's sitting, oh, there he's sitting at the back, because I know he's a fan. So this is Clash of Clans, which is another uh, free-to-play game from a company called Supercell. Supercell is a Finnish startup, kind of not a startup anymore, but three and a half years ago, it was a Finnish startup. Uh, it released this game, uh, Supercell, uh, sorry, uh, Clash of Clans for free, released another game called Heyday for free. Uh, in the first quarter of, um, uh, of last year, it made $190 million in revenue and about $110 million in profit, and it just sold a 51% stake to Japan's SoftBank for $1.5 billion, no, billion, valuing the whole company at $3 billion. And the product is free and makes lots of revenue and is profitable. And it's not just some games. This is the App Store in the UK. Uh, the top 30 games ranked by this, no, well, apps rather, ranked by this slightly arbitrary, Apple is probably the only organization which ranks creative products by how much money they make, but it does do that. Um, these are the top grossing iPhone games. 22 of them are games, sorry, top 30 apps. 22 of them are games. Those are the free games, so 20 of, the, uh, of them are free. Uh, 25 of the top grossing apps are free. And we see this pattern repeated again and again. These are companies making lots of money from being free. Eventually, I'm going to get to the answer of how. So the starting point is you have to flip your thinking. So the, what the, web, the web has done two things. Both are amazing. One of them is only amazing. The other one is both amazing and bad. Um, that one is that it's made it really easy for people to share stuff. Really, really easy. And what that means is that people can make duplicates of your music and your games and your books and your content at almost no cross, uh, cost, which means if they love what you do, they can share it. Unfortunately, they tend to do it without you getting paid, which is the bad bit. But the other thing which it's done is enabled you at a cost that was impossibly high before and now is very cheap to build one-to-one -one relationships with your customers. So I'm an author in two different ways. I have a book with Penguin, the traditional way, and I run a website called Games Brief, aimed at people who make free-to-play games, which has 20,000 readers, and I sell books from it. With the customers from my website on my own, I know who they are. I talk to them directly. I have their email addresses. I can contact them. I have literally no idea who's bought that book. Nobody will tell me. Amazon won't tell Penguin. If they did, Penguin might not tell me, and I can't talk to them again. So I love publishing. Penguin's done an amazing thing, including an advance, which is obviously important. Uh, it's got me translation rights. It's got me into books. It's got me onto Radio 4. It's done a whole bunch of useful stuff. But I don't know who my customers are. And that is a challenge. So when you flip your thinking, you start thinking about a curve. This is an artificial construct. Imagine you could take all 7 billion people in the world and peer inside their heads and say, how much do you value what I do? How much are you prepared to pay me for what I do? The depressing thing for most creatives is that pretty well everybody in the world values what you do at nothing. Pretty well everybody. Out of 7 billion people, the number of people who want to play my games or read my books is essentially zero. But along here, there are people who would value it at a dollar or $10 or $50. And if we're lucky, the Sultan of Brunei, he would happily pay $10 million for something we do. And all of those people exist. But in the old world, we had to go, right, some people don't really value it very much. Some people value it a lot. What is the clearing price, the average price that everybody will pay which will make that work? And that was about $10 to $15 for an album, a bit under $10 for a book, $40 for a video game. That was the clearing price. And now we don't need to do that. Because we can say, let's try to figure out how to let people spend a lot more money. So this end of the curve, the free end of the curve, is a marketing opportunity. It's a place to find an audience. Just to be clear, I don't always recommend you have to make your core product free. Because you guys are in music, um, yeah, you kind of have to, because if you don't, the fans will. It's going to be free on torrent. But other, th other industries don't have to necessarily make the, the heart of their product the free thing. They need to use free to find an audience. It's also the case that just by being free, doesn't get you an audience. There are a million apps on the App Store, literally a million apps. It is currently costing you around $2 to buy a free customer for your app. 
So by making it free, you don't, nobody cares. Everything's free. You have to pay $2 to get somebody to come in and try your free product. So your starting point is that you're $2 down. In our world of apps, we're quite happy if 5% of people pay anything at all, which means that if we've paid $2 to get people, and uh, only, I've just done that thing and I, I can't do the maths because I'm tired. Um, <laughs> if we pay $2 to get people and only 5% of people pay, um, we need to get, what is it, 20 times that figure in order to get, uh, uh, which is $80 from a customer, from the paying customers, to cover all of that marketing cost. Now, you hope that you don't buy all of your customers. That's the starting point. You buy some customers and then your product's good and people want to share it freely because they can, because it's the internet and it's easy. And that sharing is important. And because you're not charging up front, if somebody says, hey, check this out, the friction is relatively low for people to actually go and check it out. But all of that is just free, free. But how do I get paid? And that's that end of the curve. And you think, right, we need customers who will want to spend money with us. We need to use free to find an audience. And we need to find an audience who are happy to pay lots of money. I'll talk a lot more about specifics uh, within this, but one way of thinking about it is that my book, The Curve, is available in Amazon and Waterstones. If that isn't too much of a plug, do feel free to buy it. Um, if you want to take your phone out and buy it now, that's fine by me. But the, the point is that a lot of those customers are never going to become my super fans. So I give a bunch of stuff away for free. I have that video. I have a 10,000 word free ebook available on, um, uh, on, the, uh, uh, on Amazon itself. In the middle here, I have a bunch of people who are prepared to give me somewhere between five and 20 quid, depending on paperbacks and hardbacks and ebooks. They will not, they're not directly my customers, they're Amazon's customers. At a pinch, they're penguins, but they're not, they're Amazon's customers. My job is to say, if you like what you read in the book, how do I convert you into somebody I can talk to again? How do I get the 20% or the 10% of 5% of people who go, you know what, Nicholas's ideas are so good and so useful that I want to pay to come of one of, to one of these, for example. I want the signed edition. I want the premium edition. That's easier in fiction than non-fiction. Um, I want to become a super fan of what Nicholas does. And though nobody actually thinks that yet. They start going, I want to find out more. I want to get closer to the ideas or the author or whatever. My job is to subvert what Amazon does, what Warson does, what Penguin does, whisper this quietly, and say, you're building my audience. You can have the mass audience, because they're going to be trending towards free. I want the expensive audience. Come to my website, sign up for my blog, talk to me, and then I'll be able to figure out what it is you value. So that is the curve. It's in three parts, as you now know. Find an audience. Um, probably using free, though remember that free isn't, um, uh, isn't a, 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 an amazing thing to do anymore. It was in the early days. There are still, I don't know if there's anybody from the advertising industry in here, but I still hear people saying, we'll make this really cheap game and make it free and it will be amazing. Um, not realizing that all games are free and amazing now. Well, not all, but lots of games are free and amazing. And being free doesn't make you stand out anymore. It's a default position for a whole bunch of stuff. Then you need to use technology to do two things. The most important one is the second one. So to talk to them again. Everything you do should be, have I earned the right to talk to you again? But it's also very useful to get data. So I don't know if anybody follows Zoe Keating. Um, you should. Everything she says is great. Uh, but she just said, I would happily forego my revenue stream from Pandora, which is about $3,000 a year, in return for them telling me what my customers, at, the data. I would happily give up $3,000 of income for the quality of data which they, which they have. And then you need to enable superfans. And I'm going to break these three down. So let's start at the free end. You might not have this so much in the music world, but in my world of games, there's a lot of people who hate freeloaders. They're one very tiny step above evil, dirty pirates. Uh, and their basic strategy is, we'll give you something for free, but we'll hate you while you do it. And if you don't pay up, we'll kick you out and um, serves you right. And yet we know that 95% of people don't pay for any given game. So I think that you have to treat your freeloaders really, really well. I'll give you just four reasons now. The first one is they are a source of revenue. Um, uh, has anybody played Flappy Birds before it disappeared? Do you even know what I'm talking about? You're such not my normal crowd. Um, uh, Flappy Birds uh, was a game that came out of nowhere. It's slightly rubbish, so I can't really say that, because I was out of the country when it launched, and it got um, taken down from the App Store by its creator before I could play it, and now it would cost me about $10,000 on eBay to buy a phone with it installed. Um, but it's a relatively simple game, but it suddenly hit the zeitgeist for no particular reason, frankly. Um, and was making $50,000 a day in ad revenue. 
So as musicians, you can put your music up on Spotify and you'll make some music. The streaming revenue is never going to replace lost album revenue. Don't think it should. That's the wrong way of thinking about it. But it is some money. You can put it up on YouTube and get money from the uh, advertising stuff or just grab your tracks which are being used by other people on YouTube and get some advertising money for it. And that's money. And that's not to be sneezed at. I don't say you should or shouldn't. It depends on the context. But your free customers are still a source of revenue. I don't think it's the most important use for them, but it's real. They're word of mouth. I think that we've moved... When, when I was a student, you would, um, uh, you'd go back to somebody's room and you'd surreptitiously check out their music collection to figure out whether or not there's any basis of long-term future compatibility or not. Um, I don't know how students do it these days um, because they, it's all hidden on their iPods. I imagine they've done it beforehand uh, on their phone as they're walking back to the room to check stuff out. Um, the point is we've moved from an ownership era to a discovery era and a sharer era. It's not cool to have music. All the music I possibly want in the entire world I already have. I subscribe to Spotify, so I don't have quite everything. Uh, are the Eagles on there yet? I think I don't have the Eagles, but um, everything else I have. Um, that's kind of fine if you're the Eagles, and you're frankly already established and mainly selling to 50-plus people who still like vinyl. But if you're trying to discover a new audience, you have to be on these services because sharing is what matters, discovery is what matters. You're cool because you find a new piece of music. Whereas in my day, clearly not me, but I was cool because I found a new piece of music. And I remember finding Dire Straits, so clearly I failed that one. But the, the point is that your discovery is important and frictionless sharing is important. Getting to the top of the charts is important. Not everywhere, not every industry. But if lots and lots of people like what you do, then a whole bunch of other people go, well, this must be good because everybody else likes it. And that explains Flappy Birds and Gangnam Style and Fifty Shades. <laughs> um, so the word of mouth stuff really, really matters. But there are also potential converts. My point about freeloaders is you never know when they're going to convert into good customers. We used to have an easy model. If they've given us money, they're good. If they haven't, they're bad. But now we have this ongoing relationship where in one month, somebody might give us some money and then give us no money for weeks or months. Somebody might give us no money for eight months and then suddenly turn around and drop 100 quid on something we do. You don't know who they are. You can't tell up front. And because it costs so little to indulge them, indulge them. It's got so hard to find an audience that kicking somebody out just because they haven't paid seems genuinely crazy to me. Um, a few years ago, just before the credit crunch, um, I was in a, a yachting shop. I'm a sailor as well. Uh, it was on the Strand. Uh, sorry, it was on Piccadilly. It's shut down now. Uh, the credit crunch killed that one. And as I was looking for some stuff for a boat, I, there was a guy in the shop who I would have kicked out. He was, uh, he was overweight, he had a dirty black t-shirt, he stained and dirty, um, which seemed designed to emphasise his beer belly rather than hide it. And he had a bottle of Evian or something like that full of a thick black sludge. And every so often he'd take the lid off and spit chewing tobacco into the top of it. And I would have kicked him out. I would have kicked him out. And I was behind him in the queue and he took out a black American Express and spent £20,000 in this shop. And I would have kicked him out. I should never run a chandlery. The point is you never know who is going to become your best customer. It might take years. And if that person along the way was generating a little bit of revenue from streaming and a little bit of revenue from YouTube ads and telling their friends how cool their music is, that's really, really valuable. At one of these talks recently, somebody talked about Hanson, who now has an absolute curve strategy. It's probably taken them 15 years to wait for their fans to get old enough to be able to afford stuff. And that's a very, very long period of time to go. And the last one, the one which is absolutely deeply misunderstood, is gawkers. So gawkers are the people who make stuff value, who make stuff valuable by looking at it. What do I mean by that? I suspect that Ferrari could make its cars quieter and less yellow. But it's kind of important that people's heads turn when a Ferrari goes past or a, a, a Harley Davidson or something. People are paying for many things when they buy a Ferrari or a Harley. They're paying for engineering, apparently. Uh, they're paying for design. They're paying for brand. But they're paying for other people's reaction to them. Or they're paying to, uh, for what it makes them feel inside. And all of us, and everything we do, every time we spend money of any sort, beyond the <coughs> basics of feeding ourselves and clothing ourselves, I don't mean dressing like we do, I mean literally keeping warm, they are doing some form of self-expression. And it makes a difference whether or not other people are looking. 
I was going to say normally that um, when you uh, are sitting at home, do you just wear jeans and a T-shirt? Clearly, you go out wearing just jeans and a T-shirt. But um, I'm sure you pick very carefully which jeans and T-shirts they are when you go out. Um, but what matters is that you change your behaviour depending on whether or not people are looking. I will buy food in Sainsbury's, which says to me that I am a good ecologically aware person or that I'm a frugal person. In fact, I'm entirely capable of buying in the same basket a Tesco value and a Tesco Taste the Difference product at the same time because they're saying different things to me about different, thi uh, about different things for myself. Take that large, you go, if, people, if I want people to end up buying one of my premium items, people have to, other people have to go, oh, cool, you've got one of those. Moss Def sells a t-shirt for $45, which says, I bought the Moss Def album. When he sells it, he gives you the album for free, because he knows you won't buy the album. But you will buy a t-shirt that says that you bought the album, and get the album for free. Trent Reznor, which is the opening thing in the, the book, um, did a, a curve strategy, where he gave, he had, his album was called Ghost 1 to 4. He gave Ghost 1 away for free, he uploaded it to BitTorrent himself, um, he kind of assumed that, uh, well, Ghost 1 to 4 was four nine-track albums sold as a package. He uploaded the first nine tracks to BitTorrent. The rest appeared within minutes, obviously. On his own website, he said, get high-quality streams. The price is an email address. You can also just pay $5 for the full set. Why? Because you want to give me some money. And some people did. For $10, you could buy the uh, CD. For, I'm trying to remember the figures now. For, for $75, you could buy the deluxe CD. For $300, you could buy the Ultra Deluxe CD. Four CDs, three books in a calfskin case, numbered, one of only 2,500, signed by Trent, touched by Trent, if you're that type of fan. Um, <laughs> he had only uh, 2,500 of those, 300 bucks. He sold out in 30 hours. So $750,000 he grossed in the first uh, 30 hours, and he gave the product away for free. So people went, I've heard of Ghost 1 to 4. It's everywhere. I've listened to it. I heard it on Spotify. People pass it to me on Torrent. Oh, you spent $300 on it. You must be a really big fan. You've got the one that Trent has touched. You must be special uh, in that particular way. Um, in the first week, he grossed $1.6 million, and he gave it away for free. One of the criticisms I get when people talk about that is, yeah, well, Trent Reznor was made by the label industry, then went outside the label industry to do that, and now he's back in the label industry. And I go, no, no, that doesn't break the thing. He proved that he could do it without it, which is a great negotiating tactic when he goes back into the label system. When I was sitting talking to Penguin about the book, um, Penguin were a bit late to the, the process. And I sat down with them for an hour, and they didn't once ask me about the ideas in the book. They asked me how many Twitter followers I had, how many people I had on Gamesbrief, how many email addresses I had. They were kind of impressed I'd self-published my first book when I was a lot smaller audience and made about 40 grand in the first year just from my own website. And they kind of go, there are properly published books that don't make that much money. But I have an audience and a connection with them. And my book was bloody expensive. It was 100 quid was the starting price, and 250 quid was the top end price. Um, so it wasn't that I was selling volume. I was selling a different strategy. Well, I could say the question was, how much did I sell the copy I touched for? Um, I don't think I'd yet got that type of fandom. I reckon you might need to have groupies before you can sell something extra for, um, uh, for a book you can touch, you've touched. Um, just to bring it down uh, back to the, the Trent Reznor um, bit, obviously he, even though he was out of the label when he did that, uh, I don't know about what he did, but I'm pretty sure that he would have still had an enormous fan base. Mm -hmm. um, just trying to think how we can apply that with... Oh, I, I think, maybe so, so absolutely, that I completely get the question, which is, hold on, making lots of money when a label has invested a lot of money to make you famous is a lot easier than when you're starting out. I completely understand that. Um, my simple answer is, to imagine you can go out and in a week make $1.6 million without that fan base. Yes, no way. It's not possible. It's a slow and painful and difficult process of building an audience who will spend money with you. And there isn't a silver bullet. In the old days, that we thought there was a silver bullet. In the old days, if we made it through the gate-kept world, we found an A&R man had given us money, and we were now made um, because we had an advance. We all know how few musicians actually made royalties beyond that advance. Um, it seemed to us that that was the magic silver bullet. And most of us spent most of our lives toiling for an agent or a record deal or a book contract or whatever. We now still have to toil in a very, very hard, long, unpleasant slog, and there's no silver bullet, 
but it's much more measurable minute by minute, hour by hour. If you can build your Twitter following from 10 to 100 and from 100 to 1,000. If you can build your YouTube relationship, which indeed is brilliant because it's the next slide, so thank you very much. <laughs> um, technology. Um, you've got to earn the right to talk to them again. How do you get there? You have to build an audience. And we are seeing particularly, is anybody in the room a folk musician? Is this a folk musician audience? Folk, folk uh, musician. I have no idea. <laughs> I have no, do you play the ukulele? <coughs> no. That's so, um, most of the examples I've found who want to talk about, uh, uh, about how they've done exactly what you say, built their, audi their audience, their living without a label, have tended to be in folk. My guess is because A&R people aren't excited about folk. So folk musicians have had no choice but to find alternative ways to connect with their fans. I think folk is also, I can't define it, uh, but I think it's also something which is very much suited to relatively small, or can be suited to small intimate gigs with a close relationship with your fans, which means the very nature of the music is much more connected to closeness to your audience, as opposed to, I'm gonna show how little I know here, as opposed to hip hop where I imagine there's a bit more distance, um, or stadium rock where there's clearly an enormous distance from your fans. So uh, in my experience, we've seen people like uh, Victoria Vox in uh, Maryland, she's in the book. Uh, Katie, who I met last week, I can't remember her surname, uh, who's in Minneapolis and is doing it the same. And they started through doing relatively small gigs, getting people who love what they do to follow them, to uh, follow their email addresses, to build their audiences into the thousands or even the tens of thousands of fans, to share content, to share, um, uh, uh, to share their music. But then we need to do the next step to enable the super fans. Um, and I do have an echo here of Kevin Kelly's 1,000 true fans strategy, which says find 1,000 people who are happy to give you 100 bucks a year and you have a living. Not if your band is a 10-piece combo. You've got a, or a problem there. <laughs> Basically, if it's a 10-piece combo, you need 10,000 fans. I mean, it's as, it's as, the math is as simple as that. But what the technology enables you to do, and I think I'm going to, I'm going to slowly get to your answer, which says it's not easy you have to keep trying, there is no silver bullet. I kind of like that. Um, I kind of like that because I built my self-published games brief empire um, because I realized that I could write about the business of games without anybody's permission. I started writing for myself on my own blog at home and some people started reading it. And if I'd wanted to do that in the old world, I'd have had to start a magazine. I'd have had to have the working capital to hire writers, to have an ad sales force, to make physical copies, to figure out how to distribute them to Colombia and, um, uh, and Venezuela and Singapore where I have readers. And I was competing. I was writing Games Brief, which got to 20,000 readers before I added any extra people. There's now five of us working on it. But before I added any other people, I could write that sitting on my own, in my living room, in my underpants. I didn't, you didn't need that image in your head, but I could have done it, and that's the big change. That's the big change. And what you need to do is start thinking, how do I use what I have that they don't have to take advantage of, uh, of this new world? By the way, if having done that, if having got the Twitter followers and having got the audience, people say, you've started building something up. I'd like now to represent you as your record label. I think it's fine to bite their arm off. I don't think that they don't add value. I bit Penguin's arm off for this, although I did tell them that I could always just walk away because I can self-publish, which was probably not strictly true, but it was enough that they believed it. Um, but I have just turned down a publishing deal for a, uh, uh, an advance. There's a book out today called The Free-to-Play Toolbox, not really aimed at this crowd, where we just turned down a $10,000 advance on it in order to self-publish. The team took that decision. I'm ever so slightly nervous about it, but I'll tell you how it goes in about six months' time. Um, but we did turn down that advance. So we do think that both strategies have an answer. I'm going to keep going because there is another bit to the answer, which is um, you need to earn the right to talk to them again. What that basically means is every piece of communication you do should say, come to a place where I can talk to you again. That could be Facebook. I don't really like Facebook because that is earn the right to pay Facebook in order to talk to your fans again. So I'm not a fan of Facebook in that way. Twitter isn't like that now. But Facebook wasn't like that then, so I'm more nervous about that. I'm old-fashioned. I like email, although I'm a little bit nervous that young people don't know what email is. Um, there are other social networks I don't understand. I'm too old to get Tumblr, 
I'm too um, married to get Instagram uh, or Snapchat. Uh, I'm too male to get uh, Pinterest. So there are different kind of things which might make sense for you. It depends on your audience. I don't know which one's right for you. The important bit is you say, with every communication that you can, this is way easier, by the way, with writing, because I could just say, follow me on Twitter at the end of it. Dropping that in the middle of your songs is tricky. Um, I'd like to see somebody do that, but that's a separate point. Um, but you need to start trying to work out, how do I get people? Keep badgering Spotify to go, if people listen to my track, I want to know who they are. How can I find that out? How can you start using that stuff that if people are sharing stuff on Spotify, there is an easy way to drive them back to you? What can you append to your YouTube channel to get a call to action which moves people from the slightly passive um, uh, consumption into the active consumption? And don't worry that you can't get everybody to go because most people are never going to become your fans. It's so easy to listen to your stuff that they listened to it once and went, it's okay, and moved on. Don't worry about that. If you're lucky, you get hit Gangnam Style. You hit Flappy Birds. You hit um, uh, Fifty Shades. How many people have read Fifty Shades? Also, you're lying. Um, nobody ever admits, <laughs> literally nobody ever admits that. Um, and I don't believe you. Um, the, um, but sometimes just something takes off. And you can't predict it. You can't predict Minecraft. You can't predict Flappy Birds. You can't predict that stuff. But what I'm hoping for is a strategy which enables you to make a living if you don't get big, and wow, you do well if you do. As opposed to the alternative, which is don't make a living if you don't get big, and the record label does really well if you do. So I actually think this is a big step forward. So the last bit, which is part of your, your question, is, is to enable the super fans, because we're now expecting that most people, at least 50%, probably more, will not spend any money on what we do. So if, in the old days, 10% of, sorry, 100% of people paid you $10 for your thing, and now only 10% of people pay you anything, they have to pay you an average of $100 for you to make the same revenue. So that's what we need to think about in the world of superfans. So this is my sort of mantra for superfans. Let those who love what you do spend lots of money on things they truly value. And there's three bits of this that really matter. 